Okay, I think we are ready to start. So hello and good morning, everyone. I'm Bill Silva. I'm Associate Executive Director at the Connecticut Association of Schools. And I wanna thank you for joining us for today's webinar on top 10 strategies to address your stress, presented by our distinguished guest, Dr. Lisa Sinetti, professor in the Department of Educational Psychology at the University of Connecticut. Before I introduce Dr. Sinetti, I wanna thank our corporate partners, the College Funding Coach, Horace Mann, MCM Fundraising, Jostens, and the law firm of Pullman and Cumley for their ongoing support of CAS's high quality professional development for school leaders in Connecticut. I also wanna go over how we will proceed uh, today. During the presentation, uh, you in the audience are muted, but you may share questions that you have using the Q&A feature, and our presenter will try to address as many as she can uh, during the hour that we have today. Uh, we are also recording this webinar and we will make that recording available to you in the next few days. And now let me introduce um, this morning's presenter. Dr. Lisa M. H. Sinetti is a professor of school psychology in the NEAG School of Education at the University of Connecticut. Dr. Sinetti received her PhD uh, in psychology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2006 and joined the faculty at UConn in 2007. She's been a licensed psychologist in Connecticut since 2009 and a board certified behavior analyst since 2012. Her primary areas of research include educator well being and implementation science. Prior to joining the faculty at UConn, Dr. Sinetti was a behavioral consultant serving schools throughout Massachusetts and Connecticut. In this role, she provided assessment and intervention services to children with significant disabilities and or mental health issues and to their families and educators. I also wanna mention that starting soon, Dr. Sinetti will be contributing a periodic column entitled Wellbeing Weekly to our Connecticut Association of Schools News Blast. And we're really looking forward to that. Welcome Dr. Sinetti, thank you for being here. And I now turn the presentation over to you. Perfect. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks so much for the lovely introduction. It's wonderful to be with all of you this morning. Um, so um, as mentioned, I'm a professor in the School of Education at UConn. And um, for the past two decades, I've been working really closely with educators. My primary area of research has really been trying to figure out the most efficient and effective ways to help schools and teachers deliver effective practices for students. And one of the things I realized was that the stress uh, experienced by our educators was a big barrier in moving some of the other work forward and have really been working to identify some effective strategies, both for schools as a workplace and also for educators um, to be able to do the work that they want to do. So let's get started. Um, just to be sure we're all on the same page, um, here's a sort of definition of stress that we're going to be working from today. So the word stress is used in a lot of different ways in our everyday um, conversations. But from a psychological point of view, we really think about stress as the relationship between a person and their environment. And that when their environment is appraised by the person as taxing or exceeding their resources or endangering their well-being. Okay, so what does that really look like in our day-to-day -day? life. So as we go through our lives, we have all sorts of encounters throughout the day. And that may be with other people. It may be something that comes in on an email, a, a tough conversation we have. In every single event that we experience throughout the day, our brains automatically start to consider whether or not that interaction is positive, dangerous or threatening or relevant. And this is happening in the background of our minds without really us thinking too much about it. When our brains decide that something looks dangerous or threatening, um, we then move on to sort of a secondary appraisal. Um, and our brains automatically start to judge, can I cope with this situation or do I, can I not cope with this situation? Now, when our brains decide that something is dangerous or threatening, and that we don't have the appropriate coping strategies at that moment in time, that's when we experience stress. 
Okay, so we can see that our minds are very active um, in pursuing um, in, on our path towards stress. The other thing to know is that there is such a thing as good stress, right? So stress is like everything on a continuum. We know that um, there is a space sort of over here in the sort of comfort zone where we feel alert, we're engaged, we're performing pretty well. We then can move to this growth and learning zone where we're feeling fairly challenged, but we're having success. We may feel sort of a flow state. Um, but then all too often, we're spending too much time over in this distress zone, right? Where we're feeling fatigued, exhausted, may have some anxiety, and may lead to burnout. So I'm guessing that if you're attending this webinar, I'm assuming that you're not experiencing that optimal level of stress, but rather a higher level that may be leading to fatigue or exhaustion or worse for you. And so a really important thing for you to know is that you are not alone. Um, so we have a good amount of data on administrators. We know that in the media right now, we're hearing a lot about teacher stress, but we also know that we have a lot of data um, globally on school administrator stress. And there's actually a research team in Australia that has dedicated nearly all of their work to this area. So we know, for example, in Australia, their most recent survey showed that two out of three principals reported high levels of distress. Um, a study in Ireland that just recently was completed showed that 70% of administrators reported a significant decline in their well being. And in the US, four out of five or 80% of administrators reported chronic job related stress during the 2020 and 2021 school year. Now, these data suggest that job related stress was worse for principals of color, female principals our principals serving high poverty schools and principals serving schools with high enrollment of students of color. So the other thing we need to consider, we know that the role of administrator, I'm oh, so sorry, is stressful. However, the other thing that we know is that in America, we are living in a very stressful context. The American Psychological Association puts out a stress in America report on a fairly annual basis. And this most recent uh, report showed that 80% of Americans were feeling high levels of stress in the past two weeks. Never in our country's history have more Americans reported such high levels of stress in the APA study or any other study that's been done of the American um, public. And when asked what's making them stressed, Americans reported the future of our nation, the pandemic, unsurprisingly, and political unrest. And so this is important to consider because we know that you're experiencing stress as an administrator in your workplace, but you're also interacting with a lot of other people in your school and in your community. And it's important for us to understand that more people than not are extremely stressed who we're interacting with. And that's going to come up a little bit later as we talk about strategies. The other thing we know is that what you're experiencing is not healthy. Okay. Stress results in a wide range of symptoms. So it can show up in many, many different ways. You could have physical symptoms, headaches, clenching your jaw, neck tightness, changes in appetite, cognitive or intellectual symptoms. So trouble concentrating, forgetfulness, or losing your sense of humor, emotional symptoms, so being nervous or anxious, short-tempered, um, becoming more apathetic, or behavioral, right? So feeling sort of agitated, um, more quick to raise your voice, etc. In all of those symptoms, when stress persists over time, we know that they have a really important and negative outcomes for our physical health, our psychological health, and our professional health, right? So we're at increased risk for heart disease, stroke, decreased cognitive functioning, and chronically high rates of cortisol, for example, in physical health. In psychological health, we're at increased risk for anxiety, depression, alcohol misuse, chronic fatigue. 
And in terms of your professional health, you're more likely to have poorer relationships with your teachers and students, be absent more often, be more irritable, be less effective. Now I wanna take a second and really think about that um, outcome under physical health about the chronically high rates of cortisol. So we have some new data coming out about this that's really interesting. We have some data to show that your cortisol can increase just by being in the same room as somebody with chronic stress. So cortisol is our stress hormone, right? And we know that the vice versa is true as well. So it's important to think about the people who you spend time with, right? We know that um, you're spending time with lots of different people and you can think then about how your stress and your high cortisol levels may have a ripple effect, right? So this image puts principles in the center, but it could easily be expanded, right? To put the superintendent in the middle or others that, who are stressed within our systems. And we know that stress in education is an epidemic partially because of this ripple effect, right? We know that, for example, paraeducators are stressed, perhaps because of the teachers they work with are stressed. And teachers are stressed because they're working for order, overburdened principals. And principals are working for overburdened superintendents. So there is this ripple effect, right? So if you think about this, you may spend time with other administrators and it can have that ripple effect into their teachers, staff, students, and communities your own teacher, staff, students, and communities. Maybe you have an 092 supervisee who's sort of being affected by your stress and your significant other and children and families and friends. So we know that stress is not something that it is something you experience personally, but without even intending it, it can have a pretty significant ripple effect into the community. So if you want to help teachers and students, we know that you must take care of yourself. People tend to go into education because they want to take care of others. And what I'm going to keep saying is that this wellness work for yourself is critical. It is not selfish. It is required in order to do the caretaking that we want to do as educators. Okay, so we know that we can't control political unrest or the course of the pandemic or a whole host of other things. So we have to focus on what we can control. Okay, so we're gonna look today at sources of workplace stress that you can have some control over. I promise I'm not about to tell you that you need to spend 20 minutes sitting and meditating. I've tried really hard to pick out top 10 strategies that should be fairly time efficient, but are shown to be effective in addressing uh, individual stress. And the way that we're gonna think about these strategies is related to the major sources of workplace stress. And those can be put into three different categories. Okay. Oh, so sorry. So again, we're gonna talk about volume, velocity, and values as the three categories for workplace stress. Okay, in terms of volume, the sheer volume of work, meetings, emails, curriculum changes, policy changes, student issues, parent issues, has educators just reeling, right? And a tipping point is a really helpful metaphor for the stress people can withstand before that undefined moment where the pressure exceeds their tolerance and you become exhausted or collapse or just snap, right? It's the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. And no matter how capable you are, you have a tipping point. Everyone does, right? So think about if you put 10 people in a sauna, eventually everyone's going to have to get out. Some sooner than others, but everyone's going to have a tipping point in that setting as well, right? So volume is about overload. There's too much to do, not enough time to do it. And it's an epidemic across most workplaces right now. Um, so I'm just gonna show a quick visual related to this, right? We wanna think about what are those major sources of overload and then what can we control and what can't we control? So the bottom block, external demands. These are the things that people are, you're asked or told to do and the standard of excellence that's expected. Often we have no control over this, right? Deadlines, 
deadlines add to the pre pressures, especially when they're tight or unrealistic. We have peer pressure. So every organization, every school system has a culture, the way we do things around here. What are the unwritten rules about working, for example, late at school, answering email 24 7 365 or your ability to say no those are important to consider and then email email that was developed so that you didn't have to answer the phone so that a message could wait has turned into something that's just a deluge of responsibility in terms of electronic communication and the expectations have really increased in terms of rate of re expected responding. Now, these four bottom blocks, we don't control, but we can influence them. So we'll talk about that. The top three blocks show how we as individuals add to the problem of overload, right? Our own internal demands, the things that we as an individuals want to accomplish in a day and the level or standard to which we want to meet. This includes work-related tasks, as well as chores or activities in our personal lives. And then personality traits. Some are more prone to stress than others, right? So people who have these traits often get overloaded because they're trying to do too much. We may describe them as workaholics, overachievers, perfectionists, type A personalities, caretakers, pleasers fitting into the culture of niceness in schools, right? Do you see your list, yourself on that list of descriptors, maybe more than once? And then beliefs. So premises or assumptions that we hold about how the world works, how people are supposed to behave, what we're capable of. So any statement that includes words like should, must, need to, have to, usually reflect a belief. And beliefs are incredibly powerful for two reasons. First, we typically hold beliefs to be truths so that they become the truth for us. And most of them are subconscious. We're not even aware of them. Beliefs run your life more than you may realize. And again, if you think back to that image of the person walking along that path towards stress, we know that our thoughts those subconscious beliefs about whether something is dangerous, about whether we can cope, contribute significantly to our experience of stress. Okay, moving on to velocity. The world of work is now faster than ever, right? Computers, emails, texting, instant messaging, smartwatches, Inpatient boards of education, exhausted teachers, relentless deadlines, the pressure to keep up and score well, it's dizzying and exhausting. And to increase productivity, people are asked to speed up. But the reality is there's a limit to how fast we can go and how much we can do. And so we're gonna discuss strategies for managing the pace of work. Now, an example that I like to bring up when we think about velocity is, um, is a baseball analogy. Um, so when Babe Ruth, hit 60 home runs in 1927. Did the Yankees set a new goal for 62 home runs the next year? No. If they had, they would have been wildly disappointed. He only hit 54 in 1928. 1927 was an exceptional year for an exceptional player, but no one expected him to do it year after year. And that's a good thing because no one broke his record for another 34 years. Yet in today's world, we just keep raising the bar. So the question has become how high does it go and what are the costs to individuals trying to meet those targets? And as expectations are rising, so is the speed with which we want them, right? So we can think back here to dial up internet was so great. And then there was DSL and now we have broadband. And even now, sometimes we may sit in our computer and feel like it's being slow, right? We see it in TV. The TV shows have quicker paces. We're now watching reels and TikToks and um, wanting our entertainment quicker and faster. Highway speed limits have even been increased globally 
at a faster rate recently than any time in the past. So now the push for speed is layered on top of the increasing volume of work. And we'll talk about how to address that. And then the last one is values, which may seem a little surprising, but values are sort of guiding principles that give meaning to our actions and behaviors. And science has shown that a lack of alignment between our actions and our values or conflicts among our values can have a negative impact on our psychological well being. Conversely, successful pursuit and alignment of values is a very strong predictor of vitality and well being. But let's really be honest, when was the last time you stopped to really consciously consider what your top values are and how your daily activities are aligned with them? I know that until I started doing well-being work, I hadn't. So we'll talk a little bit about how to move forward in that area today as well. Next, I feel like it's important to note that although today we'll be talking about personal level interventions and strategies, like yin and yang, person-focused and workplace-focused interventions to decrease stress can be thought of as complementary forces that interact to form a dynamic system in which the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And so we are developing workplace interventions to improve well-being at the systems level. We won't be talking about them today, um, but I'm happy to share that information if anyone's interested. Today, we're gonna to focus on you and sort of your own personal strategies. Okay, so what do I actually do, right? Let's get down to it. All right, so volume. The first strategy, prioritize, right? Being busy doesn't equal being productive. I know this is a simple one, but it always bears repeating. I absolutely always put this in my presentations around stress management because we need to critically look at the tasks we're doing and ask questions like, why am I doing this? What need is it fulfilling? Who's requesting this work? Will anyone actually look at what's produced from this? Has this work already been done? Is it relevant to the goals of my school or district? And what will happen if I don't do this? So I'm sure none of you got to where you are today without at some point learning how to prioritize tasks. But what we find over and over again is that when we feel this sense of overwhelm by the overload of work, we're often just doing whatever task is immediately in front of us to try to get it off the list, right? To try to lessen the load. And that can make us very busy, but it may not optimize our productivity. So again, I would urge you to take some time once a week, perhaps, Maybe it becomes part of your daily schedule and prioritize. I'm sure you're familiar with seeing this matrix before. It's a really helpful way of sort of divvying up activities and tasks that come across your desk. If something's urgent and important, that's what we need to be spending our time doing. We have other things that are important, but they're not urgent and we can schedule those for later in the day, later in the week, next week. We have things that are urgent, but they're not important for you to do. And we can delegate those potentially, right? And there are things that are not important and not urgent, and we need to figure a way to get those off our task list for good because they're already way too long. So again, when you're in the midst of it, when it's so stressful, it feels hard to take the time to do this prioritization but it will in the end lead you to doing the things that are most important for moving your important work forward. All right, next, strategy two, letting it go. So it's really tough to be a school administrator, right? Tough call with the parent, teacher made some flippant remark, superintendent didn't call you out for your hard work in the last admin meeting. The reality is, is that we think more things are about us than are, right? Maybe it is about you. Maybe you messed up. Maybe you don't have a good relationship with that teacher. Maybe you like getting the gold star, but maybe, just maybe, that parent's working really hard like you and trying to stay on top of their child's schooling and is frustrated and exhausted and you happen to be the one that's on the other end of the phone. 
Maybe the teacher had a final in their grad class after school the day before and is exhausted from working and studying and caring for their family, right? Maybe the student just had a rough day and you're the recipient of that. Most often when someone, including myself, is spiraling about a situation and can't seem to pull back, it's because our focus is on the parts of the situ situation we have no control over. Right, we wanna break down those problems to what's in your control and focus your energy there. And it becomes less about what someone is or isn't doing for you and more about what you can do to better your situation, right? So we can choose how we respond to any situation, right? We can put ourselves in the other person's shoes. And remember, it probably isn't about us. We don't need to take it personally, right? We can focus on those things that we can control. We can take that high road mentality, right? So erase that long, angry text to your spouse or friend or significant other and simply write back, okay, right? And let it go. We can change gears, change the topic, leave a conversation that feels uncomfortable before things escalate or just move on. Because more often than not, those uncomfortable situations that we can spend lots of time ruminating over are not about us. And time spent ruminating is just increasing our stress. So really practicing learning to let it go is a hugely important skill. And certainly one that I understand is easier said than done. Strategy three, scheduling routines. There's a lot of work to be done. There will always be more work than there is time, right? So thus the prioritization. Scheduling routines can really help you define your work day, define your work, and allow you to move on to those other important parts of your life, right? So thinking about when and where will you work? What are your working hours? Are you an early morning person? Are you someone that's in the school super early? Do you like to work late? When, are you, when do you work at home and when do you not work at home, right? Think about your energy levels. When are you most productive? And align your activities with those. It can be hugely important to getting those high priority tasks completed. Perhaps more importantly for educators is when and how will you leave the school. Choose a stopping time, right? You are in control of how long you are there and how you want to prioritize your work. Set an alarm for five to 10 minutes before that so you can tidy up your office, note your next, next task to complete, whether that's later that night at home or back in the office the next morning and pack up your things. To make that really happen, schedule something for after your leaving time, right? I know how hard it is when you're in the office, and you're like, oh, I've done this, I've set the alarm. And I'm like, oh, but I just wanna finish these two more tasks, right? But if, and there's nothing on my calendar. So all of a sudden that five or 10 minutes, I look up and I've been there for another hour. Schedule something for after your leaving time that you're looking forward to that you're not going to miss. A workout, making dinner with a, with a loved one, listening to a podcast, meeting friends, put it in your calendar and treat it just as importantly as everything else that's in your calendar, okay? And schedule things to look forward to, right? A hike, time alone, dinner out, seeing a movie. Don't let that be unscheduled time. Don't let that be happenstance. It's important to schedule our work routines and our leisure routines as well and to take them both very seriously. All right, velocity. Strategy six, reasonable expectation. Okay, so first, beware the expectations you set, right? So is the expectation around email, for example, 24 seven, 365, we need to reply immediately. Do you only reply during certain hours? Do you use the function of scheduling emails? So for example, in Gmail, you can have up to a hundred scheduled emails. Could you put a statement in your signature that suggests 
when you check your email or when you'll reply. So I'll tell you a story. I tend to work when my kids were really little. I worked sort of seven to three, and then I would work again after they were in bed in the evenings. My graduate students thought I only worked between nine and three because that is the only time I communicated with them via email. I might write the emails very late at night, but they scheduled for the next day. What starts to happen is you start to train people about when you will reply to email and when you won't. Suddenly my number of emails that I received after 3 p.m. precipitously declined, right? Um, so again, we can think about the expectations that we set. Um, we also wanna think about um, modes of communications. Like, do you really want to give somebody your cell phone number? Do you want people texting you? Let's think about that. Too often when we're sharing multiple modes of communication, we're really breaking down those barriers and feel as though we can never be off. All right. Do you have all of those modes of communication on your phone? Right. How are we interacting with some of those things that are most urgent? And then meetings, right? So we really want to think about um, what are the goals of every meeting that you're leading, right? Are they worthy of a meeting? Are you starting on time? Are you setting the expectation by waiting that it's okay to be late? Are you running over the end time and sort of showing that in fact, other people's time isn't valuable? Right. So we want to think about those expectations that we are setting um, as leaders in a building. Okay, what is going on? Oh, so sorry, folks. Let me get back. Here we go. Okay, hopefully we can see um, the slides again. Okay, so also don't overpromise right? Sometimes we are the source of our own stress. So think about the future you, right? Always under promise and over deliver as much as we can. So often we're asked to take on just one more thing. It's not required, but it'd be really helpful. Often that work is not immediate and it's sometime in the future. It makes it really much more easier to say yes until that future time comes and we regret the fact that we said yes. Right, so stopping to think about the future you and whether or not the future you is really going to want to engage in whatever is being asked of you. All right, and then we want to go ahead and communicate and negotiate deadlines realistically, right? We can ask if when we're given a deadline, is something um, definitive or is it preferred if there's anything i've learned over time as a professional is that deadlines are often arbitrary but def presented as definitive so asking more for more details about the real deadline communicating your concerns about meeting the deadline and taking on tasks contingent with that concern can be helpful again sometimes deadlines are definitive but often they're not all right start as you mean to continue Right, and so don't say um, you have 100% of the time open door policy for staff if we can't maintain that in the future. Established patterns are hard to change, right? Don't say that we're gonna reply to every email within 24 hours or on the same day. If that's not something that's feasible to maintain. So here, again, we're setting standards that we can maintain. Don't start by providing a Tesla now if Honda's gonna be the norm, right? And also set standards about what's, when is good enough, good enough, right? So often our beliefs about we should, what we must, what we think is required are not reasonable, right? So we wanna have our, an expectations reality check. And the three questions at all times are, are those expectations achievable? Are they sustainable? And what's the cost of, to you to having those expectations? All right, in strategy five, single tasking. The reality is, is our brain can only attend to one thing at a time. That's it. That is a scientific fact. 
And it is also true from numerous studies that multitasking reduces productivity by up to 50% due to the fact that you have continuous partial attention. Our brains are not capable of doing two things at once. So you are constantly splitting and going back and forth between two different tasks. You tend to have something called the where was I syndrome. When you shift back and forth, it takes time for your brain to register what you were thinking before you interrupted yourself. Those seconds and minutes add up and you lose time and focus through multitasking. You're gonna have more uncompleted tasks. So sometimes when we interrupt ourselves, we don't go back to the first task, right? You're multitasking between two tasks and then you get diverted by a third task or forget where you've been and drift off to another activity, which leads to uncompleted tasks. But because you started them, you may forget that they're uncomplete, right? Um, tend to make more mistakes, right? Have you ever sent a text or an email to the wrong person by mistake? Replied all instead of just to the sender? That can be embarrassing sometimes. Um, most likely you were multitasking at the time. At worst, it could have been embarrassing or it could have been more damaging. At the very least, it was a waste of your time because now instead of sending one email, for example, you're, or text, you're likely sending more than one. And the last one, it turns out that multitasking can actually result in damage to our brains. Yep, that's right. I thought that would get your attention. Multitasking is contrary to the way our brains are designed to function. And as a result, it causes stress within your body. Not the type of stress we're talking about where you're um, interacting with an encounter and seeing it as dangerous, but an actual physiological stressor. It stimulates the stress hormone cortisol without our even knowing it. And cortisol we know has a damaging effect on the brain. It tends to shear dendrites from brain cells, right? So you can see here some results from a recent um, study done on the effect of stress as well as other disorders on dendrites in our brain. So what's the message here? Do one thing at a time and you'll get more done and you'll save your brain in the process. All right, strategy six, taming technology. Um, so I love this story sort of um, about sort of two people emailing back and forth. This happened at the university. There are two people and they're going back and forth, multiple, multiple dozens of emails about trying to schedule a meeting. Until so one the person just stood up and walked down the hallway and talked to the other person, it turns out a meeting wasn't even needed, right? But when we have technology in front of us, we tend to use it, but we don't always use it in a very smart way, right? So technology can be an amazing tool as long as you are using technology and technology is not in charge of you. Um, so we wanna think about when in scheduling, when you will check and send your email, right? So. Think about what those norms are in your building. Technology automatically raises the expectations of a prompt reply, but that prompt reply doesn't have to be immediate, right? We can use technology potentially to have a certain um, notification for if it's an email from someone where we really do need to reply quickly. We can take the time to set up that technology. But otherwise, we want to think carefully about when you check and send your email. It can take up way too much time, right? When during the weekdays? When are you checking on holidays or weekends? We talked about scheduling emails. And can we turn off sounds or those little number indicators that are on our apps, on our uh, phones, and on our laptops indicating how many new messages you have? right? Schedule email as part of your day. And again, if you do have somebody who send you emails and they are urgent, then we again can harness technology to provide those with special sounds or indicators or forwarding capability so that we're able to put our, know when we're going to address our email and be able to prioritize other tasks. 
you can establish protocols with colleagues. You can establish protocols within your school, right? Think about these things. Are replies expected to every email? Even a thanks? Every time somebody sends a thanks email, I feel as though there should be some sort of financial charge, right? You've now taken my time to open that email, realize it's not important and move on, right? So we can send protocols or set protocols with our technology, with our colleagues about it's okay to not send the thanks email, right? Maybe we just do a red receipt instead. So we can set up some of those things. The other thing we could think about is sending fewer emails means we're probably going to get fewer emails. So taking the time to walk down the hall and get something addressed more quickly reduces emails both for you and for your staff, right? So thinking about how we can actually do it the old fashioned way and have the face-to-face -face interaction can be really helpful. How can we use subject lines to be sure that we're communicating emails that are urgent, things that can wait, right? And also sort of thinking about our messages, right? TLDR, too long, didn't read, right? Can we be sure that we're establishing protocols that we're getting the most important information to people as succinctly and um, as quickly as possible? instead of spending super long times drafting emails that then require our colleagues to spend a long time reading our emails. Also thinking carefully about how we use reply all and CCs. Again, we know that the American public is stressed. We know all educators are stressed and email is one of those pieces about velocity and overload. So does everybody really need that email? Do we really need to CC all those people, right? Let's think about some protocols about how we can use our technology effectively. And then creating filing systems for messages, right? So do we wanna go ahead, do you need to answer every email when you sit down to schedule your email? And maybe you feel like you do. But maybe if you think back to that Eisenhower matrix, we can think about, oh, this is an important email, but I can reply to this later, right? And so we want to have a system for knowing that you will go back and answer that email later. So we have a flag in your email about things that you're waiting for a response on, right? So you know what those things are and how do you archive your messages so that you can find what you need later efficiently. And again, not spending as much time searching through your email for things that you need. So the other thing to remember, because technology is so much a part of our daily life now, is that smartphones and the ability to always be working hasn't always been the norm. And there are studies about the impact of technology on work hours, right? So before smartphones, um, a study of American workers showed that participants worked about 47 hours a week. And only seven months after having quote unquote work phones, right? Or technology that were used for work, the average participants time worked went up to 71 hours a week. All right. Um, we know that um, a recent study of American workers use of technology outside of work hours showed that half of Americans check emails in bed right when they wake up. And 40% were still checking emails at night after 10 p.m. 57% admitted to checking emails on family outings. And a little over a third routinely check their email at the dinner table. Do you fit in those categories? And is that necessary? How can you think about some simple ways that you can control your technology instead of technology controlling you? It's not going away, but we need to sort of reshape our technology relationship. Okay, next. Strategy seven, um, timeouts. So the fact is that breaks throughout the workday will reduce your stress. Breaks restore energy by improving alignment with what's called our ultradian rhythms. So yes, timeouts, they're not just for children. Um, and the stories that I'll tell you about this is, for example, Alexander Graham Bell, 
right? Used to sit over by the Grand River in Brantford, Ontario, watching the water go by and thinking about his experience. And it's there where he had his aha moment and he conceived of his most famous invention, the telephone, right? So I get it, you're not gonna go sit by a river and come up with how you're going to reform outcomes in your school. But I also wanna think about sort of a more typical workplace situation now. So think about going to an all day conference. How would you react, right? If when you started the conference at 8.30 a.m., the organizers announced there would be no breaks, not even for meals. No morning break, no lunch break, no afternoon break. I bet a lot of people would get up and leave or take the breaks anyway, right? We expect breaks at a conference. Like I said, typically mid-morning, lunch, mid-afternoon, yet in our quote, real non-conference work days, we book ourselves all day long without even stopping to eat, right? And we know um, that this is not good for us. So I'm sure you've all heard about our circadian cycle, our 24 hour cycle, but we may not have heard of this ultradian rhythm, right? So this is a two hour cycle in which our energy and activity level goes up, it peaks, it comes back down, and then it hits a trough for about 20 minutes in which our bodies go into a semi state of rest, whether we want them to or are aware of them doing it or not, and we start a new cycle. And these are time related, not situa situationally related. So um, ideally, right, we're going to, if we pay attention to these sort of natural cycles that are happening anyhow, we can really improve our feelings of well being. Okay. One of the problems with high velocity workplaces is that you get so involved with the details of your work, you're sort of losing sight of the bigger picture. And these quick breaks, they don't need to be a full 20 minutes. I get it, that's not realistic for you, it's not realistic for me, but quick breaks can give us an opportunity to reflect on what's going on, contemplate things from a little bit more of a distance, okay? Breaks allow you to get your best ideas. So across multiple studies, we know um, that people get their best idea in places like in the shower, on a walk, while commuting, right? No one claims to get their best ideas, quote, at work. Let's think about that, right? The other thing we know that's interesting is that repetitive motion seems to facilitate the getting of ideas. Walking, jogging, biking, sewing, knitting, Einstein used to get into his rowboat and row across the water when he couldn't solve a problem. And often the solution came to him. And although we didn't know it in Einstein's time, now we understand why that's happening. It turns out that when your mind is busy attending to a repetitive motion, your subconscious is working on the problem. And we have data to suggest that nitric oxide is released in these situations. And nitric oxide increases the blood flow to our prefrontal cortex, that part of the brain that does problem solving. Boom, science, right? So as much as you can, schedule your work in blocks. I know that's not always possible, but if we start to think about some 90 minute work blocks, then take a quick time out for yourself. It might be a walk around the school, go high five some students, Go deliver some positive notes to a staff. Go hang out with kids at recess. It doesn't have to be long, but that quick break is going to help you reset and get back to that level of high performance that you're looking for. All right, next, moving on to values. So values are words that describe how we want to behave in this moment and on an ongoing basis, right? Values um, are an on, um, they're sort of an ongoing action. So it's how we wanna behave in an ongoing way. It's not sort of just situationally specific. And they have sort of global qualities, right? So let's suppose we're gonna stick with baseball. Let's suppose you wanna play baseball. 
And that's a behavior you can do on an ongoing basis, but it's not a quality of action. So qualities of action related to baseball could be playing baseball skillfully or enthusiastically or passionately. And to get to your values about baseball, I might ask, so how do you want to play baseball? What qualities or strengths do you want to model or demonstrate? And maybe that would uncover values such as wanting to be focused or fair or supportive of your teammates or giving it your best. And those qualities are always available. Even if you had a significant injury and you couldn't play, you could still be focused, fair, supportive, right? The other thing about values is that they're desired. They're how you want to behave or act. They're not what you should or could do. You're actively choosing them. They're not goals. Goals are things you're aiming for in the future, things you want to get, have, achieve. Values are how you want to live right here and now and on an ongoing basis. And they often have to be prioritized. And we spend next to no time considering them or identifying them. So to do that, I'm gonna give you three different activities that you could spend a little time with. So you could do the first activity and think sort of 10 years from now, if I look back, what would I say? I spent too much time worrying about what? I didn't spend enough time doing things such as, if I could go back in time, what I do differently is, right? Responding to some of those prompts may help you identify some of your core values. For the video of your mistakenly held funeral, Imagine you're a little bit like Tom Hanks in the movie Castaway. You're on a plane that crashes in the ocean. You're unharmed. You're stranded on a desert island. And meanwhile, back home, everybody thinks you're dead and a funeral is held. A few weeks later, you're rescued and you fly home to a really happy reunion. But later, you get to watch a video of the funeral that was held for you. At one point, somebody you care very much about walks up to the microphone and starts talking about you. What would you love to hear that person say? What sort of person were you? What were your greatest strengths and qualities? How did you treat them and others? Okay. Another approach is to look one year from now and you're gonna look back on a difficulty you're having today and imagine you handled it in the best possible way, the best possible way, behaving like the person you really wanna be. What qualities or strengths did you act upon? How did you treat yourself and others, right? So taking, this is just sort of a, a matrix of some really common values that are endorsed by folks, but it's not exhaustive for sure. But can you think about first clarifying those values that really mean the most to you? how you want to act on a day-to-day -day basis, how you want to be known. And once we do that, then we can sort of move forward and thinking about our ninth and 10th strategies, right? Living a life that reflects your values increases feelings of meaningfulness, purpose, and happiness. All day long, we are doing things. Right, we're called human beings, but I joke that you, we should be called human doings, right? And likewise, our minds are constantly at work trying to warn us, remind us, plan for the future, make sense of the world. And our minds are incredibly efficient and automatic in giving us messages, right? And so you can think of your mind as a sort of over eager assistant. It's constantly handing you notes, messages, telling you what you have to do, things to watch out for, suggestions about how to do things, how capable you are. And sometimes those notes are really helpful from your assistant. And sometimes the notes are overwhelming, misleading, upsetting, or just otherwise unhelpful. But here's the trick. You're the boss in the situation. You get to decide what you do with the messages that your mind gives you. Right? So as the boss, how do we want to respond to our overeager assistant? Ignoring the assistant is not helpful, right? We can choose how to respond. And what if next time 
we focus on reframing, right? We focus on those messages and how they're aligned with our values. We're gonna focus on something else called flavor and savor. So let's focus first on reframing, right? And this is can be both for thoughts that our brain is giving us as well as our activities throughout the day, right? So the most concrete way to start with this is to just think about the activities you do during a day, right? That's step one, doing the most concrete things. And then we can move on to thoughts and think about how they are or could be aligned with your values, right? So my example that I give all the time is around doing laundry. The reality is, is I disdain doing laundry. I always have, I believe I probably always will. And my mind's default thought then is like, oh, this is just one more thing to do, right? And that define, default just makes it sort of a stressful situation, just as piling on to my to-do list, right, is a perception. However, when I shift that, when I reframe and I think about laundry and making that aligned with my values, I can now think about laundry as a way that I show love for my family which is one of aligned with my values of being a good mom, of being a good partner, right? And suddenly now by reframing the way I'm thinking about tasks that I can't not do, I'm improving my own well-being. I'm not having that same stress response when there's a pile of laundry that needs doing. So reframing both our activities, which is the, gonna be your first step because it's the most concrete. We can also think about those automatic thoughts. Right? How can we reframe those to think about whether or not those are aligned with our values? So an activity I would challenge you to do, um, to really be thinking about your values and think about how you can increase those in your day in terms of, again, we're gonna focus first on activities because that's the easiest, most concrete way to move forward. Is each morning or once a week, whenever you're able, choose a value you want to bring into play that day. And then throughout that day, find opportunities to sort of sprinkle that value into whatever you're saying or doing. And so we talk about this as flavoring your day with your value. And so when you flavor it, savor it. Notice the effects of living your values and how that impacts your day. So an example um, for me is when I'm leaving a meeting, sort of my default has always been, right, we get started. We're going to review the agenda. We're going to drive through the agenda. I'm going to try and give people and myself some minutes back at the um, end of the meeting. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with that necessarily. But when I take the time to sort of think about sprinkling in my value of increasing connection with others, I then have sort of shifted to start with having everyone report out in one of my weekly team meetings with a weekly win from each team member, which really does increase my connection to those individuals and their lives outside of these team meetings. And it makes the meetings and the team process so much um, lovelier in terms of meeting with these folks, right? It was a pretty quick way. Sure, it might take five, six minutes, right? But it's really, um, good for my well being and reported from my team members. So, again, flavor and savor is a quick activity you can think about doing to try to increase the amount of time you're living your values. All right, and our last strategy sort of giving thanks and unhooking. So, again, when those automatic thoughts come, when our brain, that eager assistant, gives you um, some thought. Again, our mind is doing its job. It's trying to protect us, but we're in charge of what we do with those thoughts. Very simply, you can say, thanks so much, but I'm moving on. You don't have to accept those thoughts as real or important or something you need to prioritize, right? So think about being in bed. You're thinking about a tense interaction earlier in the day. Your mind starts running through what you should have done. Right? Not terribly uncommon for me in the evenings. And I can just say, thanks so much, mind, but I did my best and I'm moving on and just put an end to it. And again, the more you practice this, the more you become aware of the fact that that is just a thought. It's just a thought. And I don't have to attach to it 
My mind's doing its best and I can move on. I don't need to ruminate on that thought and wind up not sleeping well and then having being more stressed the next day, right? The other thing we can do is really thinking about unhooking, right? So all of this is sort of thinking about when you have that automatic, automatic thought, being able to pause and consider our bit, the bigger picture. So think about it this way. We have an upset parent who leaves a voicemail. Your mind's automatic message, oh, this parent doesn't like me, right? And you could ruminate on that for a long time. That could lead to your delaying responding to that parent, not wanting to respond to that parent. It most likely will impact your interactions with that parent. But again, we have no idea if they like you or they don't, right? It's just your mind giving you a message that we can attend to or not. We can unhook from that thought by recognizing the automatic message. And then there's a couple of different strategies that are recommended and are quick and easy. And the more you use them, the more efficient they'll become. If you have the automatic message of, they don't like me, right? Instead of that becoming a truth, like I talked about before, right? We tend to accept our these automatic messages as truth. You can put the phrase in front of it. I'm having the thought that the parent doesn't like me, right? Take a half a step back from that thought or even a sort of two steps back from that thought. I notice I'm having the thought that that parent doesn't like me, right? It gives you a little distance from that thought to be able to decide whether you're going to engage with it or you're going to unhook from it. And last, if you really want to unhook from the thought, and I know it sounds silly, but boy, does it work. Start singing that tune, that thought to a children's song, to happy birthday, to row, row, row your boat, right? When you have those negative thoughts, you don't have to hook to them. We can make them seem silly, funny, and be able to more quickly move on and not let ourselves slip into that stressful situation. Okay, and really quickly, how do I make it happen? Behavior change is hard, right? Think about any New Year's resolution. We know we do well for those first couple of weeks and very often then it gets a little iffy and then maybe we stop doing whatever we said we were going to do, right? but I'm gonna urge you to have perspective and commit to trying, right? So if we think about this January here, this doesn't look so great, but if we take perspective, it's a whole lot better than how we were engaging in that behavior in De December, right? And then we can commit to success. Often when we commit to success, once we fail, we feel like a failure and we stop, right? But when we commit to trying, and not expecting perfection, we tend to persist. And is it all green check marks? No, but it's a heck of a lot better than December. Okay, the other thing, strategy I'm gonna give you in terms of if there's a practice in here that you want to put into place, we know that starting new habits is hard, right? But the cue routine reward process can help a lot. So have a cue that prompts you to use that new behavior or that new routine. Then you're gonna have some sort of strategy or behavior you wanna use more often, and then figure out some sort of reward or immediate benefit for yourself, right? So I've started a new routine of starting to run again after not running enough during the pandemic. And my cue is that when I drop off my, my kids at the school bus, I go for a run, and I'm rewarded with more energy, some closed circles on my smartwatch and feeling more settled and energized to be able to do my work, right? So developing a habit plan, what's your cue gonna be? What's the really quick and easy routine and what's that satisfying reward, right? So I close my rings, I feel great. And every once in a while, I even give myself a little Starbucks coffee, right? On days it was extra hard, but I did it anyway. All right, so here's your 10 strategies. Again, don't tackle them all at once, but pick some that relate to you. Use that habit plan, commit to trying, 
And bit by bit, you're gonna be able to decrease your stress and increase your well-being. All right, and I'm happy to take any questions or comments if there are any in the chat. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Sinetti. What a terrific presentation and very helpful and immediately useful information. I know I was taking notes and I, I find myself guilty of many of the bad habits and um, <laughs> hopefully we'll be able to at least put in place a, a, a few of the better habits um, to address my stress. Um, but just a terrific presentation. We really appreciate your sharing your expertise and insights uh, with uh, all of us uh, this morning. Um, I want to thank uh, our CAS's corporate partners uh, once again for their support, College Funding Coach, Horace Mann, uh, MCM Fundraising, Jostens and Pullman and Cumley uh, for supporting professional development for Connecticut school leaders. And I want to thank the audience, of course, for um, their participation and uh, attending uh, today. Um, we've recorded today's webinar and you'll receive notification when that's available. Uh, I wanna let you know about a future, uh, some future CAS programs uh, coming up in the next few weeks. On Monday, March 14th from four to 5 p.m., we'll be hosting Principled, Navigating the Leadership Learning Curve, presented by authors Kate Barker, Courtney Ferua, and Rachel George. And on March 31st is our third Education Equity Virtual Summit featuring an exceptional lineup of speakers and panelists on the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion from different perspectives. So please join us for this not to be missed event. Again, thank you, Dr. Sinetti, um, just really valuable and helpful information. Thank you to the audience. Check our news blast and our webpage at cascic.org for information on all CAS events and activities. And on behalf of all of us at CAS, I wish you well. Have a great day and a great end to your week. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye.